Well, praise the Lord. Good day, brothers and sisters and dear friends. And welcome again as we open up for the last time in our study in the letter uh, that Paul writes to these churches in Galatia. And what a wonderful study it's been over the last few months and weeks. We saw how Paul addresses these Judaizers who comes into these churches in Galatia and they try to bring these people back under the law. And I highly recommend you to go over these notes again. Because in our day and age, we do find people who want to bring in their own agendas. They want to bring in their own rules and regulations. There's a lot of emphasis on, on certain themes in the Bible. Uh, overemphasis on certain themes. And moving away from the cross of Christ. The focus point of all preaching the focus point of all teaching must come to the cross of Christ. That is where the price was paid for us all. And it lies within our faith within that cross. What the work that is done. That we may believe. This is what it's written there in John chapter 17 verse 3. He says, what is eternal life? Let me read it for you before we get into our wonderful study. And we're going to finish with Galatians today. But he says, and this is eternal life. So we are all seeking for eternal life. What is eternal life? Jesus answers this to his disciples that final night before he goes to the cross the next day. He says, this is eternal life. What is it? That they may know you, the only God and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. We know him through faith. Uh, in Ephesians chapter 2 verse 8 says, For by grace you have been saved through faith. That not of yourself, so that no one can boast in that. So this is what's been happening in that church. And Paul picks up the pen and he writes this letter to these churches in Galatia. And we're going to finish the chapter today. We're going to go down to verse uh, chapter 6, verse 18. But we want to kick off in verse 11. Because Paul says here, he says, See with what large letters I have written to you with my own hand. Now there's many scholars who believe that Paul may have written the whole letter to Galatia, this whole one, from chapter 1 verse 1 right to the end. Because he says, see with what large letters I've written. It is also known that he had an eye pediment, that he couldn't see well. He had eye problems and this is why he used big letters to write this letter to these churches. But this by far is not the only time that Paul picked up the pen. Back in the day when they would write these letters, they would have a secretary or somebody who would who would write down. He will notate to, to this person. He will say the paragraph. He will say the words and the person will write it down. Uh, but Paul, on various occasions, picked up the pen himself and it's sort of like a signature. Like we've got a signature on papers. If I'm finished, you, you sign it and it means that this is your letter. This is, you give, you give authority to what's written on this piece of paper. Uh, if you turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 16 verse 21, we find that Paul did the same thing to the letter to the church in Corinth. He writes this following in his own hands. He says, he says, the salutation with my own hand, Paul. So he picked up the pen. So he, he did his notifications to this, this person. They wrote it down and then he picked it up and he says, I am writing the salutation. Paul. And again in Colossians chapter 4 verse 18, he is doing the same thing. He says, this salutation by my own hand, Paul. It is sort of his signature in there. It, it shows us that it is Paul who is behind the uh, authenticity of these letters. He authorizes them. In 2 Tim uh, Timothy chapter 3 verse 17, he writes a little bit more. He, he writes, he says, The salutation of Paul with my own hand, which is a sign in every epistle, so I write. That, that said it for me. You know, Paul wanted to make sure that people understand it's him who wrote those letters. It's no other person. And that, 
that is the authentication of these letters. Now let me also remind you, although Paul wrote these down, he wrote down every single word in all of his letters under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. You must not forget this, that when you open up your Bible, it is the spoken, it is the Word of God that you are opening up to. I want to read to you uh, 2 Timothy uh, chapter 3, verse 16. And, and this is a very important uh, scripture verse for you to understand when you open up the Word of God or the Bible. He says, uh, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16, All Scripture... So even the whole letter of Galatians or Philippians, which we've done, is given by inspiration of God. That word, the inspiration, the Greek meaning is to be breathed. That means that your whole Bible is breathed by God. Although it's been written by so many different people, different men, but it is God who breathed it. And it is really interesting when he uses that word breathe in Greek. You know, we breathe. We need breath. I pull my chest full of air and now I'm bringing those air over my vocal cords. And in my mind there is a thought that's forming. And my brain is using every muscle in my mouth, my tongue, my vocal cords, everything to bring those thoughts into, into voice, into sound. But it can't happen without breathing, without air. How privileged are we to, when we read the Word of God loud, that we are, we are adding our breath to these words and it becomes alive. But before our breath, it is the breathing of God. He says, all Scripture is given as an inspiration of God and it is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. Why? That the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for, for every good work. I love the Word of God, and this is why the Word of God is equipping us. So Paul says, I write this, and I, I, I put my signature on there, but behind Paul is the Holy Spirit, and God is breathing the Word, so that we may have it today. Now let's look at verse 12 to 13, because there's a really important final warning that Paul gives these churches. In verse 12, he says, as many as desire to make a good showing in the flesh. Take note, good showing in the flesh. These would compel you to be circumcised. Underline that word compel in your Bible. I'm going to talk about that now. Only, why would they compel you to be circumcised? Only that they may not suffer the per persecution for the cross of Christ. There's an agenda. Verse 13. For not even those who are circumcised keep the law. They are just actors. It is acting. It is hypocrisy. They give forward which they are not. They show you in the flesh circumcision, but they are not. They are two different kind of people. He says, but they desire, what is these people's desire? To have you circumcised that they may boast in your flesh. Wow, I've seen this so many times, so many times in churches. And you've, you've got to listen carefully to this final warning here. I know we've been talking for weeks on end about the law versus faith. Works plus is faith, versus faith. And we emphasize on the just shall live by faith alone. I know we've emphasized, but please take the warning here at the end of this study that Paul is giving us here. He says there are those people with an agenda who comes in and they compel you. Now that word compel there in the Greek means they constrain or in a way they force you. It is like somebody comes around you and you've got the freedom with your arms and they constrain you, they pull you in and they hold you with their power. And how do they do that? They do it with mental manipulation. We all know if somebody is physically manipulated, it is strength. I'm stronger than you and I can manip uh, physically manipulate you. But this is a mental manipulation that takes place. And you've got to be so careful, my friend. 
Be careful, very careful. This is a dangerous thing that can happen. Manipulation is a harmful exercise over somebody else. It is in fact an imbalance of power. That's what manipulation is. It's an imbalance of power. Think about physical manipulation. I'm stronger than you. I can grab a hold of you and I can constrain you. That's manipulation. It, it is, it's an over imbalance of power. But so there can also be a mental imbalance of power. A mental manipulation. And this is happening so often in the church. Why? Because we are working in a spiritual world. We're talking about the Holy Spirit. We're talking about Jesus whom we cannot see but we love. We talk about God who we can't physically see. It's a spiritual world. And this is why it's so much more dangerous man mental manipulation. Now these men are very clever because they know your weakness. And once they know your weakness, they will pounce on that weakness. You know, I, I often tell people, manipulators of the Word of God won't go to the pastor. I don't have these kind of mental manipulation going on because they know I know the Word. And I always say to people when they come with this extra relational knowledge, if it's not in the Word of God, I don't believe it because this is the power. This is the truth. But I know the Word. It's not my weakness. But for some who would come into the church, these wolf with sheep clothing, they will look around the church and they will find the ones who do not know the Bible. They know your weakness and then they will come with their mental manipulation. And they will manipulate you. They will bring you under their control. There's an imbalance of power that's going on. It is over-shepherding. It is um, uh, all of these things. So they know your weakness. And they will work on your insecurities. That's what they do. They, they come next to you and they will find out what is your insecurity and they will use that insecurity that you have to their benefit. They will come to you and say, oh, the Holy Spirit told me to tell you this. And they will address the insecurity that you have. Be careful of these actors. This is the warning today. They... Um, they, they will ask you to give something important up so that you may depend on them. Oh, don't you read the Bible? I'll read it for you. Don't you try? I'll, no, look, this is what Paul, he says they compel you to be circumcised. And why do they compel you to be circumcised? For one reason only. This is their agenda and I've seen it over and over and over again. Why at the end there of verse 13 he says, but they desire to have you circumcised. They uh, mentally manipulate you in, in the spirit. They come and they put their control over you. And now they follow. They've got a following going after them. Their own little disciples who just follow them. Uh, you know, it's my pastor. It's my church and all of these kind of things. Why? So that they may boast in your flesh. It's not clearer than that. So watch out for these. This is the final warning that Paul comes and he writes this down to them. Be careful of these, of these people who, <coughs> who want to boast in your flesh. I've seen it. I've seen people who come with their agendas and they push it forward. And then afterwards I see a lot of young souls get hurt and they walk away from the church. Why? Because of these men. Because of these men who's coming in. But let it be known, these men's day will come when they stand before Christ and give an account to Him of what they've done. Now let's finish in verse 14 down to 18. Paul says now, he says, But God forbid that I should boast. You see, he's putting those men who boast in the flesh of others. He says, I don't boast in anything of that. Look now in your Bible, he says, Accept the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. I love this verse. He says, I, if, if there's anything I want to boast in, that is the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ. Brothers and sisters, let me just say to you outright that, you know, we need to boast in the cross, nothing else. There's nothing in this flesh that we can actually boast in. Nothing. 
There's no good in this flesh. And this shows us our identity in Christ. This is a beautiful picture of our identity in Christ. You see, we, the practical application that I'm drawing from this verse is that we need to emphasize our boasting only on the cross of Christ. That's what the emphasis is here. Our identity, our worth, and our, our pride, if you want to use that word, should not be rooted in worldly achievements uh, or worldly appearances, but only in the work of Christ, which is done on the cross. Paul says at one stage to the church in Corinthians, I don't want to hear anything but Jesus Christ and Him crucified. This is it. Every preacher, every sermon of every preacher should have Jesus Christ and the cross in the sermon. Go and listen to the sermons that you've been preached to. If it doesn't come to Christ, there's a different agenda. Every Bible study. You know, this is why I say there's a lot of emphasis of words in the Bible. You know, even discipleship. I hear some people just preach sermon after sermon after sermon on discipleship. And there's nothing about Christ. You can make disciples for anybody. But you have to become a disciple of Christ. And the only way you become that disciple is through the cross of Christ. That's our identification. Now he says in verse 15, For in Christ Jesus neither circumcision nor uncircumcision avails anything but a new creation. So we saw in verse 14 that this is our identity in Christ. And now in verse 15, he shows our unity in Christ. This is our unity. Uh, we're a new creation. Doesn't matter whether you're circumcised or not circumcised. Because these two factions are against each other now. I see it so often in our day that we are from this church group and we are from that church group and we are from that church group. And that just separates. But, but brothers and sisters, let me just say to you, if you are born again and you're a new creation, that's our unity. That brings us together in Christ. The significance of being a new creation in Christ is rather than, than our outward religious appearances that matters. This is so important for us. The fellowship amongst believers happens regardless of your cultural background. What language you speak, where you come from. If he saves you, you're in the body of Christ. That brings unity. You're a new creation. The circumcisions and whatever is all gone. You're a new creation and that brings the unity together. And we share this identity as a new creation in Christ. Now let me finish three more verses. And as many walk according to this rule, peace and mercy be upon them and upon Israel of God. From now on, let no one trouble me, for I bear in my body the marks of the Lord Jesus Christ. Brethren, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you in spirit. Amen. Now what is Paul ending up here with? He ends up with resilience in faith. How resilient are you in your faith? Look at this man. He says, let no one trouble me. He says, because if you look at the body, my body, the marks of the Lord Jesus Christ is in my body. You can go through the book of Acts and see and other books and see how many times he's been beaten and persecuted and all these things. But you know what? It just builds resilience. Are you resilient? Or is the first thing that happens and you say, I'm going to lose my faith. But no, Paul says, our resilience is in our faith. And these marks of the Lord Jesus Christ is now in our body. The marks that he had on the cross is now in our body. We learn the importance of this resilience and perseverance in our journey of faith. We, and there's going to be many more to learn of these things, all the challenges we may face, the oppositions, the trials, everything Paul says in this place here, it's the marks of your Lord Jesus Christ and it becomes our witness. So there you have it. I pray the Lord has blessed you with the study through Galatians. If you've missed a few, it's all on YouTube. Go back to the first part and work it all through. And may the Lord bless you and keep you. Remember the identity in Christ, the unity in Christ, and stay resilient in your faith. May the Lord bless you and keep you in the name of Jesus.
Now we're going to kick off next time with the letter to the church of Ephesians. The letter of Ephesians. And we're going to start looking where this church started. This is the only church that we find in the book of Acts right through to our own letter of them. And we see them in Revelation. May the Lord bless you. Amen.